All right, set up here and let's go to We've got Facebook. seven participants already. We've had people waiting to join. Well, hi, okay. everybody. We're just going to give uh, the rest of the audience some time to join. So we'll probably wait a little five minutes. If you all don't mind holding on. Um, I'm Neve Vaughn. I'm co-manager on the Nature Nature campaign. Uh, today we are presenting on wildlife keeping in Trinidad and Tobago species, prevalence, populations, and harms. And Mark, our campaign director, well, volunteer director, will be presenting on his PhD thesis work. And we're very excited to hear about what he's found. Uh, also with us is Lauren Ali. She's also a co-manager, but she's going to hold off until Q&A section. So I'll be introducing Mark in the presentation soon. So we'll just hold on for a few minutes and wait for everyone to join. All right, we are live on Facebook. If anyone wants to reshare the link, you can find us. I'll just share this to chat. All right, there it is shared in the chat for anyone like to share on Facebook. Great, well, people are still rolling in, it seems. So we'll just wait a few minutes. Um, thank you guys for joining us this evening. Uh, we know it's a busy week and everyone's probably just getting off work now, but we're really pleased to have you with us. So yeah, just hold on a little bit longer and we'll kick it off. Great. Well, I think we kind of probably got everyone that's going to join us on Zoom. We have a few people with eyes on us on Facebook, so we can probably probably kick off. So I'm very happy to have everybody here with us this evening. My name is Neve Vaughn. As I mentioned earlier, uh, my, I'm a co-manager on the Nurture Nature campaign. And I'll be just taking a few minutes to introduce the topic of today's webinar, and I'll present a mark. Uh, the webinar is titled Wild Animal Keeping in Trinidad and Tobago, Species, Prevalence, Populations, and Harms. Firstly, the harmful and illegal wildlife trade is a massive global problem. This somewhat jumbled drawing came out of a 2017 symposium with the Oxford Martin Schools Program on Illegal Wildlife Trade, which discussed the diverse challenges and motivations of wildlife consumption and trade and this drawing attempted to illustrate the contextual complexities of the illegal wildlife trade. Clearly, it's a complicated issue spanning different communities, countries, the whole world, really. It's even been estimated that the illegal wildlife trade causes an annual loss of up to $23 billion in resources globally. 
This is not a precise estimate, but rather a conservative one, so we can imagine the number is actually even higher. The illegal wildlife trade is up there with the illicit trade in drugs, counterfeit money, humans, and oil, with criminal networks and industry supporting it. While this trade stretches across the globe, it also stretches across the tree of life, with a huge diversity of species being extracted from the wild for consumption. Plants, fungi, coral, mollusks, other invertebrates like insects, starfish, butterflies even, are traded. Of course, vertebrates like birds, fish, mammals, amphibians, and reptiles are traded as well. Vertebrates, in fact, consist of the more charismatic animals, the ones humans most identify with, and as such are the species most often studied in the trade, while aquatics, plants, and invertebrates are underrepresented. All in all, there are many data gaps globally in illegal wildlife trade research. And this is true, of course, in the Caribbean, where most studies provide only basic information on the illegal wildlife trade. The most commonly reported are parrots, like this blue and gold macaw seen here, uh, ubiquitous in the pet wildlife trade in Trinidad and Tobago, the critically endangered hawksbill sea turtle, which is captured for its meat and shell, uh, the queen conch, which is uh, wholly overfished in the region, and the Cuban crocodile captured for meat and exotic pet trade. The Caribbean is home, of course, to many plants and animals that are threatened by the wildlife trade, but often, as little as, often little is known about this, which is in stark contrast to the fact that social marketing for conservation was born in St. Lucia in the late 70s, when a pride campaign was launched around the St. Lucian parrot seen here, which today is the basis of a number of similar campaigns around the world. Despite all of this, the trade in Trinidad and Tobago is largely hidden. Locally, we know it's there. It's an open secret, as many might call it, but it's sparsely documented in official reports or scientific publications. And this is where the Nurture Nature campaign comes in. Research is essential to the work that we do in our bid to end the harmful trade in pet wildlife in Trinidad and Tobago. It informs our, all our outputs like storytelling and messaging like these images from our social media. And the quotes seen here are from anonymized interviews with wildlife pet keepers. It also informs, audience, informs the audience we target. Uh, like you that have joined us this evening for this webinar and our previous webinars. Again, thank you for being with us this evening. Um, our presenter, Mark Gibson, has been the volunteer director of the campaign from its inception and his PhD research starting in 2018 on the illegal wildlife trade in Trinidad and Tobago has been a major bedrock for the campaign's efforts. A little more on Mark, as I mentioned, he is the volunteer director of the campaign. He's a PhD candidate at Michigan State University and he's a green criminologist specializing in wildlife trades. And Mark will tell us more about green criminology soon. And he also has a wide experience as a conservation projects manager with projects with World Wildlife Fund even in the past. Now, much like any good PhD student, Mark has been working on this research for years and we are beyond excited to have him today uh, to share with us what he's learned about wildlife keeping in Trinidad and Tobago, the species, prevalence, populations, and harms. And so with that, I'm going to hand you over to Mark. Thank you very much, Neve. Really appreciate that introduction. I will just get our screen share here going. Terrific. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity after a good many years now to share a little bit of what we've learned. Uh, and uh, I think just as we jump into this, I'll, I'll just say it has very much been a community effort and uh, one that I've been very privileged to be part of. Um, so the, the scope of what we present today is is broad. Uh, we have learned a tremendous amount and it wouldn't have been possible without uh, so many people supporting so many uh, great NGOs and, and persons uh, along the way. So uh, with that, let me just jump into some background on what is 
wild animal keeping, if we want to consider this. It's a little background here. So important to consider is we've actually been keeping wild animals as humanity for a very long time. It goes, and in fact, predates history, recorded history. You can talk about ancient Egyptians, and Romans and Greeks. You see many animals appearing. And as a result, over time, we have our domesticated animals today. Creatures that have evolved to be uh, well suited to human captivity, living in close proximity to us. And over time, the desire for these animals has grown in many ways, in many facets. So you can imagine that early humans would have really been after these animals for sources of food, labor, protection. And today we really get into a diversity of motivations. And this is just one typology up on your screen and I'll let you just read it. But some of the, the main ones you can see is that we have functional uses, things like medicine, uh, relational aspects, companion animals, even spiritual purposes, um, that uh, having a bird in the home in Asia can improve the feng shui of the home. So there's so many purposes that we now keep wild animals. However, we have a lot of reason to be concerned. Animals that remain wild, by definition, are not meant for easy human captivity. One of the biggest issues is by that extension is animal suffering and mortality it is so common, unfortunately, in wild animal keeping and the wild animal trade. You can consider issues like injuries. Uh, I won't read off all the, the, the pictures and captions, but I encourage you to just take a look as we go through this. Uh, injuries are very common in the home. Parrots might mix with dogs and a parrot that could live up to 80 years, one day a dog plays too rough with it, and that's a broken way. You also have commonly uh, diseases appearing in captive animals, things like this red-eared slider here with immune response, because it's so hard to actually give them the proper nutrition in captivity. You also have commonly issues of depression and stress. Animals like a capuchin, which are meant for socialized life, living in large extended troops, often in captivity will live solitary lives. In some cases, some animals even turn to self-harm. This is a very vivid image, but I have actually seen far worse. And this you can often see in parrots. Uh, they will, in a way, dr be driven mad and, and pluck out their own feathers. And as already suggested, malnutrition is very common. Human keepers don't often think what their animals need or even know or have access to the resources to understand that. Beyond this, many traded animals also die along the way. They might die as a result of traffickers trying to uh, dispose of the evidence like this orange wing Amazon you see here. It unfortunately was recovered by authorities, but was so badly damaged, it was euthanized. Other animals, they might be seized in such volumes that in fact, it's not well discussed, but very often they, wild animals seized by authorities will often end up euthanized. Maybe they're not from that ecosystem and they can't just be released into the wild. And because of all the other issues related to just captivity, for nutrition, disease, injuries, many animals die along the way. And this is just a small sampling of the images that we've collected as a campaign in the last few years. It just shows the range of animals and how many really die. I've heard estimates, for example, if you look at the bottom right, the chestnut bellied seed finch, I've heard that estimates as high as 80% of those animals will die in transit. Beyond animal suffering and mortality, ecological issues, extinctions and invasions. Live animal keeping, it's a leading cause of extinctions. In fact, in New, New World parrots, it is capture for the pet trade is the leading threat to populations. And then in Trinidad and Tobago, you have many species which are not considered locally, in, or sorry, globally endangered, but in fact, locally, are almost extinct, extirpated. 
You have ruddy breasted seed eater, otherwise known as robin, gray seed eater, locally known as pico plat, and the chestnut bellied seed finch known as bullfinch. Very hard to find in the wild and almost exclusively now imported, where we must assume they are similarly being serially depleted. Wild animal keeping has also spread many invasive animals around the world, and Trinidad and Tobago is no exception. Things like aquarium fish, which are so numerous, in fact, we wish we could have gone deeper into, but remains an area that has a lot of potential for exploration. Animals like the three spot gourami and other creatures that are not from this part of the world the common waxbill, the red eared slider, and the red eared slider you'll be hearing a bit more about as it is introduced here in Trinidad and Tobago, and it's considered one of the 100 most invasive animals in the world. What else? Injuries and zoonotic diseases. This harms not just animals, ecosystems, but humans as well. Captive animals can cause serious injuries. Capuchin monkeys, which are so popular these days in Trinidad, can have serious repercussions for families where they are kept. And as I have heard in very real telling of stories, monkeys often will even break loose and attack a neighbor's child, as I've heard once upon a time. Or macaws will severely bite the significant other of the keeper because they're so territorial and possessive. Captive wild animals also are vectors for serious diseases. These can be diseases that they naturally have in them or because they're captive, because they're at the mercy of other sorts of vectors like mice and mosquitoes in cages that they also collect other diseases along the way. So in birds, you have psittacosis, which is a type of chlamydia, which can spread to humans. Avian flu, parrots have been found to be a vector, possibly attained through infected pigeons. Tattoo or armadillo, can be a vector for leprosy as is often known, but also leptospirosis collected through just being in captivity. And then monkeys can be natural carriers of yellow fever and acquire tuberculosis in captivity. Last, because of all these harms, wild animal keeping is typically regulated, but not always. And you'll hear about some cases today where we don't have coverage yet. But it means that you have a lot of illegal animal keeping. In fact, it's kind of a regular thing to keep an, a wild animal in Trinidad and Tobago and to do so illegally. That's what our research has uncovered and I'll be telling you a bit more about it. Animals will be kept in the back of a house, um, known to the keepers, known to neighbors, but not immediately apparent. Animals will also be sold illegally online. Wildly so, it's a free for all. If you go on to public or even private Facebook groups, you can see advertisements like this, people looking for a monkey or have a monkey to sell, sloths, very common, especially around this time of year for people to ask for a parrot. And because these are illegal, because it's so hard to obtain them legally, smuggling, smuggling is a very common issue as well. And that means that Coast Guard, other enforcement efforts will be made to stop smuggling and typically the animals will be killed along the way by traffickers. You can see here a box of bullfinches was thrown into the water and here it's being fished out by the Coast Guard. And because the traffickers are not veterinarians, they are not people who necessarily care about the welfare of the animal, you see them kept in terrible conditions all over again, like you see here in the both inches below. All these are pictures from Trinidad and Tobago. And here's just a few more, macaws and Amazons. And after seizures, you'll often see extended cages and we'll have to figure out ways to deal with them and places to put these animals. So what is known about wildlife keeping in Trinidad and Tobago? That's a complicated question because as Neve suggested earlier, it's actually an open secret. But if you look at the literature, it is pretty dark. It's an unknown trade for the most part. 
The government does express concern about the wildlife trade, such as its national wildlife policy and its recent submission to the Convention on Biological Diversity, but it's just a small amount of information. News reports, however, are very common. Um, it's a little dark humor, but I continue to say my favorite headline I've ever seen is this one here, fishermen held with hand grenades and protected animals, monkeys. You do not travel with hand grenades and monkeys together. It is a bad idea. But beyond this headline, there are so many more to grab your attention. This is just a small example, right? You can take a moment and just skim through it. Illegal, 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 smuggling dead animals, right? As for research, scientific-based research, there's really no directed studies on wild animal keeping in Trinidad and Tobago. And if I had more time, whether you'd like it or not, I would probably tell you also how it's pretty limited globally. But keeping into Trinidad and Tobago, what do we know about wildlife keeping? Here are some examples. In fact, the best study on the organization of the trade is from 1991, and it looked at the trade of parrots out of Venezuela. So here you see this map. If you look at the top right, you see the delta and some big fat arrows pointing right to Trinidad. Those are parrots being smuggled across. Beyond this study from 1991, however, that's just some images of parrots, you have other um, research where it will mention illegal activities in passing, things that will study uh, the harms or the solutions perhaps, like Sue and Agra Murthy in 1996, they studied the decline in primate populations and attributed it to illegal hunting. Player and colleagues studied the reintroduction of blue and golden macaws because in fact, they had been, well, I'll just go back, because they had been extirpated from the island as a result of illegal agriculture, habitat loss, and the illegal pet trade. But it's just a passing uh, bit of information in all these studies. And that really continues today. For some more recent studies, Khan and colleagues in 2017, really interesting study, uh, looking at physical differences in ocelots that are native or not native to Trinidad and Tobago. Animals that have really been smuggled across as part of the pet trade. And it looks like there's some evidence to suggest that Trinidadian ocelots have black noses, where South American ocelots have pink or mottled noses. Mohammed and colleagues in 2017 also report on sightings of potentially invasive red-eared slider turtles, which are sold all over the country. And you can see some of these uh, sightings here on the map. They're spread all over and they are breeding in the wild and they are aggressive to local turtles, many of which have not been assessed globally for their, their conservation status, but they are believed to be threatened locally, if not globally. And then another really fascinating uh, study, most recently, C. Paul and colleagues found a novel virus, pox virus, in smuggled songbirds. But again, the emphasis is on the virus, not the smuggle, not, not the smuggling, not the trade, not the motivations that drive it. So we have very li limited descriptive information. So with that, we began a research initiative that has attempted to close some of these knowledge gaps. So for some background, the context of our study, the goal was always to do research for the purposes of advocacy. My own background is in conservation project management and advocacy, and I really wanted to see that carry through as part of my own research. I developed initially a very humble research plan, and then through the support of some amazing uh, friends and members in, in the local conservation community, uh, we were able to develop a much larger platform. And this included the conservation leadership in the Caribbean program, and the Center for the Rescue of Endangered Species of Trinidad and Tobago, CREST. And from that initial preliminary research by these groups, we were able to develop a larger research um, plan and in fact submit for what was eventually funded by the US government. So as a result, we conducted research and expanded to have an, a nurture nature campaign, which is backed by a coalition of 13 NGOs. You see CREST in the top left, 
the, the longtime successor NGO, and then many new players. In fact, if you're from Trinidad and Tobago, you probably recognize some of these logos, some of the biggest names in conservation and animal welfare in the country. And we are so lucky to have them with us. And all this is made possible by our incredible donors, USA and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And that has brought us to where we are today, Nurture Nature Campaign, which is about, about raising awareness and promoting action across the entirety of the wild, uh, the illegal wildlife trade in Trinidad and Tobago. Our research is guided by two paradigms. One need mentioned earlier, green criminology. And that is what I think of myself as a green criminologist. What is that? Well, in the traditional context, criminologists would look at mainly illegal acts. There is some wiggle room on that. Sometimes they'll talk about deviant acts, but typically those acts are also illegal. However, in the realm of environmental work and dealing with animals, non-human species, many times things that are harmful are not actually regulated or strictly regulated. So green criminologists will look at illegal acts, harmful acts, and often consider how they intersect or do not intersect. Methodologically, we also work within the mixed methods research paradigm, which is all about bringing together multiple methods to study complex phenomena. It can make for more sophisticated analyses, sometimes make maybe more complicated analyses, but it's far more interesting, especially when you're engaging in advocacy to understand the nuances and the subtleties of what you're dealing with. For our study focus, we had to adopt some definitions. We could not look at everything, though we still looked at a lot. First, we said we wanted to look at wild animals, but if you wanna get a bit nerdy about it, it's not so easy to say what is and is not a wild animal anymore. It's a little more complicated. In fact, there's some elements of culture that go into deciding what is and is not. So if you look on the right here, here's some great examples. Top left is probably the most commonly kept pet bird in the world, the budgie. It is typically bred in captivity when you source it for your own companion animal. And they do show some physical differences from wild budgies, but captive animals can also be reintroduced to the wild and made invasive. So is it domesticated? Mm, some people will talk about semi-domesticated, for our purposes, we just said, if it is not necessarily dependent on human captivity for survival and breeding, we will call it wild. Other examples, if you look at the top right, the orange wing Amazon, the most popular wild animal in Trinidad and Tobago, many people I will often hear locally say, ah, oh, it's a domesticated animal. Well, that's just common speak. Actually, what they mean is it's tame. It's not domesticated, it hasn't changed. It's just like its wild counterpart. And almost always it is sourced wildly. You have the Burmese python down below, similar to the budgie. It shows physical differences, but can become invasive. It's almost always sourced from captive breeding in the pet trade. But in fact, you have wild populations which are threatened with extinction. And then once again, you see our one of our favorite animals to knock on the red-eared slider. It does show some possible differences from other red-eared sliders, almost always sourced. Uh, through captive breeding, but it can easily be reintroduced into the wild. So we called all these animals wild, all right? That was one of our first definitions that we had to adopt. We also had to narrow our scope, all right? We know in research there is a bias towards animals, but we see that there is a much stronger foundation for advocacy. Um, I always found this a little um, illustrative. This is one pet store and you can see they're marketing parrots, they're marketing fish and turtles, if you look top left, dogs. They anthropomorphize fish and turtles because they're not as grabby. But you get the parrots, you have a lot of real images. Same thing with the bullfinch, if you look there between pet and store. We thought focusing on animals was a stronger foundation for advocacy. And we also had to narrow ourselves to terrestrial animals because at the end of the day, we cannot study it all and we have limitations as researchers 
And we did not have a strong enough basis, we felt, to study the aquatic species because there are so many of them and it is a far less studied area of research. So with that, we established some goals, a goal and some objectives. Our goal was to explore and establish baseline information on the harmful and illegal wildlife trade. And that's what you're gonna hear about today. How do we decide what to do? We set these objectives. These are common data gaps all over the world, diversity of the traded animals, the trade volumes, the scale and nature of the harms, including illegality, organization of the trade, motivations and decision-making. We've covered all of this, but today I am going to keep us to a strict hour on presentation. So we just look at the first three today, and I do look forward to presenting a bit more in the future. All right. I will just briefly touch on our methods that are being used here today. We had many methods used. Our four methods employed for today that are the foundation of what we've learned and what we're presenting to you. First, we did a household survey, very rare occurrence, in fact, in wildlife trade research. We did this in 2004 households across Trinidad and Tobago. And we did so with the help of the Central Statistical Office, which gave us the ability to do randomized sampling so we could project for estimation on a national level. Everything was done anonymously, and the method was approved by the MSU Institutional Review, Review Board for posing low or no risks to the participants. We also engaged in informant interviewing, perhaps my personal favorite form of research, and we did a lot of this. Uh, we ultimately interviewed formally 246, what you'd call informants. Uh, it sounds like a crime investigation, but it's actually a term from anthropology, people who know a lot about a topic. We advertised at community centers and online using posters like you see here on uh, the main page. And if you look close enough, you'll see at the bottom of those posters, our original name and logo, just a little different from today. And we talked to most of all pet keepers, we did interviews and focus groups. And we went through and talked to a whole other range of communities, pet shop operators, veterinarians, conservationists. And even in a small number, we were able to sit down and interview wildlife traffickers who as ever, as a criminologist, I will say, it is amazing what people are willing to tell you, even though it implicates them in doing wrong things. Again, this was approved by the MSU IRB. Ah, and here's just another image. This is a qualitative software. We make interviews, we turn them into transcripts, and then we code them. We assign units of text to be able to keep track of themes across interviews. This was very important to our research. We engaged in official records review. And for that, I have to give a big shout out to the Trinidad uh, Forestry Division, which was so helpful in providing records as they were able. They provided us one of the core sources of our official records, which are anonymized records on wildlife possession permits, both applications and approved applications. They limited it uh, from 2016 up until August, 2018 after which we weren't able to get disaggregated data just due to staffing shortfalls. The agency does a lot with very little. We also had publicly accessible CITES import records. These are records from the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species. Many animals are required to have such import records to come into a country such as Trinidad and Tobago, which is a signatory. Again, this was approved by MSU IRB. That's just a CITES permit example. Last, our fourth main method for today, participant observation, going out, experiencing it for ourselves. We did this actually in two ways. We engaged in in-person observations. This involved going around, seeing wild animals being kept at public locations, and when able, with proper informed consent, even in private homes. We also engaged in online observation of wild animal keeping and trade via public Facebook groups. And again, this was approved by MSU IRB. And here's just another example. You can see uh, 
there are so many posts online for people selling animals. You can learn a lot. All right, with all that set up, let's get into our results today. What are we gonna teach you a little bit about Trinidad and Tobago and its wild animal keeping? So our results today, I'm gonna talk to you about the species that are kept. And we limited that to species that we could identify as traded for private keeping since 2016. The prevalence. What percentage of households keep wild animals? And how does this vary from Trinidad to Tobago to the national level? Populations. How many wild animals are in captivity? This does take some estimation work and you have to be pretty conservative about it if you don't want to overshoot, but it is pretty illustrative of how massive this activity is. And then harms. What is the scale of extinction risk, invasion risk, animal suffering and illegality. And we can tell you a little bit about that. So let's just jump into this. Species. How many species would you guess are kept? Terrestrial wild animals. How many are kept in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, through um, some strict criteria, we're actually able to identify 190 plus one species complex. So at least 191. That species complex of all things was the Galapagos tortoise, which has a complicated taxonomy and can represent as many as 13 species. So we say 191, 191 species in shorthand. These were largely identified by multiple methods, although not all. At over 50% were identified by two or more methods. And it is important to point out that the household survey, in fact, was least effective in identifying our species. Many people who keep these animals don't know the name of their animals. So the household survey identified 41 species, but an additional 44 were ambiguous reports. So I have a capuchin monkey. Well, that could be three, four more species that we know are kept locally. So let's talk about what types of animals. Most of all, if you just look at the breadth of animals that are kept, it's birds. It's all about birds. This is a big bird keeping country. And that is a pretty big panel on, you can see here, but it just shows the range of parrot species that are kept. Over 60% of the animals we identified are birds. And you'll see for those people, lay persons among us, I apologize for the taxonomic names, but I can explain some of them. Cetaciformes, that, are, that means parrots, right? Parrots and macaws are kept. Ah, and we've, we've actually added the common names. Thank you, Neve, I, I see that now. Uh, and then we have passeriformes, songbirds, perching birds. Uh, we had in quite numbers. So let's see what some of these look like most commonly. These were the most common parrot parrots that we found. We're just kind of getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but these are some of the most common examples of parrots that you see here in Trinidad and Tobago. And here, perching birds. You've heard it before, chestnut belly seed finch or bullfinch, gray seed eater, pico plat, and more. All of these animals are actually known by other names locally. Things like semp, right? and chat, and dung. And then we had plenty of other birds, other family, taxonomic families represented, things like hawks, birds of prey, the, the national bird of Tobago, the coprico, and even animals that just did not make sense, but were, were identified as kept. And magnificent frigate bird of all things, it is one of the most highly migratory birds, and it was kept in captivity, although, as we, we learned, it did eventually die. After birds, it's all about reptiles. Close to 20% of the species we identified are reptiles. So these are squamates, otherwise known as snakes and lizards or scaled reptiles. And here you have in front of you some of the images of the snakes that are kept. red tail boa, rainbow boa, green anaconda. That is the largest snake in the world by weight. And plenty more. The students. Ah, and here are lizards. 
getting ahead of myself. Some of these you might see are actually more from the, the pet trade, but some are quite local. So the green iguana, you would get that locally, whereas the three-horned chameleon would be non-native, just like the leopard gecko. Then we've got testudines or shelled reptiles. Again, you've got red-eared slider, the most popular shelled reptile in the country, but plenty of others. Things like the spot-legged wood turtle, scorpion mud turtle, some of which have not been assessed by the IUCN for their conservation status. And then last, you had crocodilians. American alligators kept privately. We identified then the more locally available species spectacle caiman, and even the dwarf caiman, which is native, but very rare as I understand it. All right, after reptiles, we had mammals. Again, just a little bit a smaller percentage than reptiles, but around 17% of all the species we identified are mammals. The most noticeable, carnivores. Things like cats and other animals. The lion is kept privately. We are able to identify jaguar kept privately, and even some compelling evidence suggests that some had escaped captivity and into the wild at one point. Other animals like the ocelot, which you heard about earlier, and you can see there, the pink nose. That means it's probably from South America. Primates. Smaller numbers of primates by volume, but some of the most notable, notable animals because they're so charismatic. Animals like the red howler and plenty of capuchins, like the tufted capuchin, the wedge cap capuchin, and more. And then other mammals. Things like sloths, anteaters, Haka, nine-banded armadillo. They're not as common, but we sure could identify them. Even one instance of someone keeping privately a Jamaican fruit bat. And last of all, we found of taxonomic classes and orders, arachnids and centipedes. So we are actually able to talk about some invertebrates here. Of course, it was a very small number. People don't seem to love keeping spiders and centipedes, but we do have a few species here. Things like the pink-toed tarantula, the Trinidad chevron tarantula, which is endemic and not yet assessed by IUCN. And then the tropical centipede, the Amazonian giant centipede, the largest centipede in the world. So we found an incredible array of terrestrial wild animals that are kept privately in Trinidad and Tobago. How common? Well, if you want to talk about just wild animal keeping, we can compare it to domesticated animal keeping and all animal keeping, thanks to our household survey. But again, I'm going to caution you because that household survey was less informative than all of our methods combined. So we know that these reports are going to be underreported. All right. But even still, we came up with some pretty good numbers, 16.9% nationally, 16.9% of all households in Trinidad and Tobago keep a wild animal of some form. That is one in six homes with a wild animal. However, if we compare that to domesticated animals, you may expect it's not as much. Close to half of all homes keep domesticated animals. And if you notice, I'll just flip back and forth, Fairly consistently, we found evidence that Tobago keeps more animals in general than Trinidad. But because Tobago is a much smaller population, maybe around 60,000 people compared to 1.2 million in Trinidad, you see the national average is not much affected by, by Tobago. So there's domesticated animals. But if we add it all together, you actually get a pretty stellar number that half of all homes in the country keep some type of animal privately. Let's look at this by species. What were the most popular species that we could find on the household survey? Okay, well, from left to right, you see the domesticated animals are in orange and the wild animals are in blue. Dog, of course, man's best friend. 35% mean estimate of households keep a dog, either purebred or mixed. However, right after dog, more popular than cats and even chickens 
in a country that is so in love with its chicken, uh, you have the orange-winged Amazon. In fact, close to 8% of homes keep orange-winged Amazon parrots, locally known as the green parrot. And then you had plenty of other wild animals mixed in. Chestnut-bellied seed finch, very popular, the bullfinch. Lovebirds, you see an asterisk there just because that's actually an aggregate report, like I told you, not everyone knows what species of lovebird they have. So that could represent a couple there. And then all the way at the end, the 15th most popular, the red-eared slider turtle, one of your most invasive animals in the world. All right, let's consider this by species group. We'll just take a little deeper dive. A key point here is that, again, it's all about the birds. All right, so this is our prevalence rates for wild animal keeping, again, one in six homes. And as I flip to just bird keeping alone, you see it doesn't go down that much. It's around 15, 14 to 15% of homes keep wild birds. And then parrots account for a lot of that yet still, right, it doesn't go down very much. Around 12% of households keep parrots. However, if you keep a parrot, you keep a wild bird, it doesn't mean you don't keep something else. So you're gonna see our numbers still representing many other types of animals. And let's just show you how few keep the other categories. However, by home, well, here again, wild animals, 16.9% for the national. And then let's look at this for reptiles. Yes, very few, around 2.3% as a mean estimate keep wild reptiles. Uh, and I should have said before, for those who know your statistics, we see some confidence intervals here. That's at a 95% confidence interval. So we could expect the true mean estimate to follow, to fall somewhere within that confidence interval band. And then for wild mammals, even fewer. So if we think about this for the most charismatic animals, monkeys, jaguars, ocelots, yeah, you notice it more, but in fact, more likely it's the parrots. All right, let's go talk about populations now. How many wild animals are kept in Trinidad-Nebago? So there is no perfect way to measure this. So we adopted a conservative approach, okay. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about what I mean by there's no great way here. If you wanna estimate how many animals are kept in captivity, you actually have two variables to consider. How many households keep those animals and how many instances of those animals are kept. Some animals a home may only have one. I would guess the home probably only wants one jaguar. Two might be a little bit too much. One is probably too much, but lovebirds, almost always come in a pair. But it gets a little tricky because when you're estimating this out of a sample of 2000 households, yes, many will report a wild animal. You might have small reporting on particular species. So you don't wanna necessarily trust it. And the probability distribution, a lot of aspects of statistics, you can assume that if you have 30 samples, 30 instances or more, it would tend towards a, uh, what's called a normal distribution of mean, but you only ever have at least one animal and some would have different rates of keeping. So you're probably looking at something other than a normal distribution, something with more of a fat tail to the right for you statistics lovers out there. So here's some of the observed averages from a household survey, the budgie. Okay, how do we get 23 on average budgies per home? Some of the households probably were breeding and they did not own up for it, okay? So some of those were probably animals they keep for personal use, but also animals they breed for the pet trade. Red-eared sliders, commonly bought in pairs. Kids want more than one turtle. Parrots figure the turtle needs some company. And even orange wing Amazons tend to be kept a little bit more than average in greater numbers than one. But because we didn't wanna overshoot it, we made an assumption that we had one animal per species per household. And even with that, we were able to estimate quite a bit of harm occurring in the trade. So let's just look at this. All right, brace yourself for a tiered pie chart. Total, 
we had 102,000 captive wild animals estimated in a country with 1.3 million people, roughly one captive wild animal for every 13 persons. If you get into your confidence interval, this range somewhere between 56,000 to 154,000. But again, this is a conservative estimate based on how we approached it. So we just work in this section and going forward with our, with our mean estimate, 102,000. If you look at the center of the pie chart, you'll see birds are all in orange. That's 83% of the estimated population, most of which, if you look outward, are parrots and perching birds. In blue are reptiles, almost entirely accounted for by shelled reptiles. And then you have mammals, almost entirely accounted for by a whole range of different types of mammals. And then the largest single family was primates. And then much, much smaller numbers of centipedes and no spiders, arachnids were reported on the household survey. Okay, with that population estimate, we are actually able to consider our harms. So we look at our harms in several different, in, in two different ways really, by the total number of species identified and by our mean estimated population. So let's get into some harms species extinction risk. This is the one that you talk about most in wildlife trade research. Doesn't necessarily mean, however, it's the most important, but this is the most common. So let's begin with this. So by species, 33 of the 191 identified species are listed as threatened by the IUCN, International Union of Concerned Scientists. Five are critically endangered, 12 endangered, and 15 are vulnerable. You see an asterisk there because the Galapagos tortoise, the complex that we identified, could be one species falling in any of those three categories. So it's those numbers plus one somewhere. Of animals that are really concerning, con, uh, big concern for us would be the pawi and the white fronted cabbage, both critically endangered and endemic to Trinidad. We also had eight native species that have not been assessed by the IUCN, and some of which are endemic like the Trinidad Chevron tarantula. If you consider the intersection of this harm and law, all of these animals can be held by an ordinary permit issued by the government. There would be no special criteria to keep them, although the agency may impose that discretionarily. If we consider this, by our population numbers, again, ah, I think we have lost one, one image, but all right. Um, by mean population estimate, 80% of the population is least concerned, all right? So what, what does that mean? It means that mm, most of our trade is not an extinction risk, though there are certainly a lot of concerns. Animals that are identified as endangered have fewer left in their populations. But based on our household survey, we would say that the populations of endangered animals that are kept are either small or cryptic. So small because so few people keep them, or cryptic because they know I cannot admit having this animal. Less than 1% of our identified species are in fact threatened and the remainder between that 80% and a 1% are either near threatened or ambiguous report. We couldn't really tell what it was. And that 1% of threatened animals was identified alone by military macaw and gray parrot. All right, let's go to invasive species risk. This is again, something that we identified with a smaller number of animals, but it still remains very real problem for wild animal keeping in the country. Eight of 191 species are non-native and listed in the Global Invasive Species Database, which is an emerging effort. So in fact, we probably should have some more in there that we have uh, are introduced or kept, but this is what we have right now. Four of those species have been introduced, two of which, if you look at the, the right column, small Asian mongoose and house sparrow, those have not been introduced by the pet trade. Small Asian mongoose was introduced to control snakes when there was a lot of uh, sugarcane planting. House sparrow is just dispersed around the world and is in fact a domesticated animal that lives in close proximity to humans. Uh, but on the left, you see the common waxbill and again, the red-eared slider. 
Then you have other species that are also listed in the database but have not yet been introduced, thankfully, but should probably be a special consideration. But when you look at this by law, of all of these eight species in the database, seven require ordinary permits. There's no special criteria or restrictions on them. And in fact, one of those animals can be kept without limitation as it's considered vermin. As a mean population estimate, only red-eared sliders meaningfully were reported on the household survey. And that came to a population of a mean estimate of 3,300 individuals. That's quite a lot. If someone has five of them and decides to release all into a pond, that could be a breeding population. All right, improper care. This is something that you really don't see much in the research, but it is such a problem. And so we had a lot of, uh, it was pretty fascinating to try and dig into this and try to make sense of it. We made use of something called the E-Mode scoring system. This is a, a scoring system developed by veterinarians in published literature, peer-reviewed literature, to assign categories of difficulty to animals. Basically, should you have this animal in your home, is it easy, moderately difficult, difficult, or extremely difficult to have? Of our 191 species, all are categorized as either moderate, difficult, or extreme. Most were difficult, and then the next uh, greatest category was extreme. Of the extreme animals, you can have almost all of them with a permit or no permit. And then two are prohibited for about part of the year when it's closed season. It's a kind of quirk of the law. But it means that there's, again, no special considerations for animals at exceptional risk for improper keeping. And if you look at the, the graph here, you'd see that birds overwhelmingly were the most difficult. But again, that's just by species number. And then if you look for moderate, you'd see the bird, two species of bird species were moderate. And then the centipede, the giant Amazonian centipede is considered moderately difficult simply because it doesn't live up to 10 years or more. I'll just pop back. Uh, by mean population estimate, we asked all of our survey respondents, if their animal, if each by each species, how many of each species that they had had ever been seen by a veterinarian even once. What's wild is wild animals almost never are taken to a veterinarian even once. By our mean population estimate using the percentages disclosed, we have 101,000 of 102 mean estimated animals being either difficult or extreme. And then 93% of our total estimate never having been to a vet. So nine out of 10 wild animals kept in the country will never go see a veterinarian. By comparison, only 40% of pet dogs and cats will never have been seen by a veterinarian. Still a pretty high number, but nothing approaching wild animals. And by comparison, dogs and cats are considered easy to moderate for keeping, not difficult or extreme. However, if you look at the, uh, this broken down by a pie chart, you do see a slight trend for the more extreme animals more often being taken to see a veterinarian. So again, if you start in the center, difficult. And then if you extend outward, the shaded areas, uh, that means no veterinary care. And then the extreme on the left, the red, 52%, again, of the population is, is estimated to be extremely difficult to keep. And then you have about 5% of the total population of that being extreme, having gone to a veterinarian. So it's very low. Veterinary care for wild animals is very low. So with all these harms, let's just consider our last aspect of harms before we move to discussion and Q&A. Illegal possession. All right, there is in fact a lot of risk and a lot of evidence for most of these animals being kept illegally. So let's talk risk. I'll have to take you into the weeds for a moment, but prop, I promise to try and keep this light. Based on the main conservation law in the country or law governing wild animal possession, you have three categories that you can assign to a wild animal for its possession. Either you need a permit, no permit is needed ever, or 
no permit is possible for the closed season and you cannot have it during the closed season. It's a quirk. It makes some animals illegal to have for part of the year. Basically means you're not meant to keep them ordinarily in captivity. And you can look on the right, these are different rules from the law. And I won't take you down to that hole very, very much, but you have some animals that are specially exempted, like what would be categorized by law as vermin. And then some animals specially included as requiring a permit, like a second schedule animal under the Conservation of Wildlife Act that requires a permit, things like a bullfinch. So by species, 167 of 191 species kept in the country require permits. Overwhelming majority, you need a permit. 14 of those species do not need any permits and 10 cannot be kept year round. By mean population estimate though, it, it comes down to a little bit less of a majority for permitted animals. 42,000, 43,000, roughly 42% of our total estimate require permits. Around 33% you cannot keep year round. And rather fascinatingly, that most popular pet wild animal in the country, the orange wing Amazon, accounts for almost all of it. That's right. For those of you guys living in Trinidad and Tobago, under the law, you cannot have an orange wing Amazon in your possession during close season. It's illegal, but I'm sure everyone knows someone with that bird. 25,000 animals then are not subject to any sort of permitting rules. If we look at how this presents as a tiered pie chart, this is just risk. Red would be you just can't have it year round. Green means that there's no restrictions. And then yellow means you need a permit. And this is if you just wanna get into the different rule categories. All right, estimating compliance. So again, I'll have to take you a little into the weeds, but I think it's rather worth it. And so we were able to estimate compliance on the island of Trinidad alone, thank you to the Forestry Division who provided us a range of records, but they were patchy. So we had to do some estimation. All right, so what, what did I mean? Is after August, 2018, we didn't have disaggregated data and our survey ran from 2019 to 2020. Permits are only valid for one calendar year at a time. So we had a survey that straddled two periods and we had just numbers on issued permits for 2019 and 2020. So we didn't know how many animals per permit were legal, but we had a little bit older data that could provide us those averages. So if you look at the table on the right, you see two types of permits. You see the numbers issued for 2019 and 2020 by each class of permit. And then you see the average number of animals permitted on each type for the prior period. And it allowed us to have a very generous proxy. What we decided is rather than pick 2019 or 2020, let's just give a generous proxy of assume 2019 and 2020, all are legal, okay? That means we estimated there were 1,200 legally permitted animals at the time of the survey. Again, very generous two years in fact of, of issuances. And then we had a mean estimate on the island of Trinidad for 41,000. So 1,200 we estimate were legally permitted in Trinidad, 41,000 however acquired permits. That's 97% estimated non-compliance. If we go into again, the, the estimation methods, we were very generous on legal animals and we were very conservative on how many animals we think are in captivity it's quite likely that the non-compliance is approaching something like 99% or more. If we wanna look at total compliance, all animals, all animals kept, well, you can assume that the orange wing Amazons are not returned to the wild come close season. And if you do that alone, you get a 70, a compliance rate or a non-compliance rate of 72%. So 72% of all wild animals are illegally kept. If you look at this by a tiered pie chart, red, the animals you just can't keep. So we uh, were generous again, those legal estimates there. We did the survey during 
open season, so it couldn't say they were illegal at the time, but it's likely that the other reported animals were also kept during closed season later. So that's a generous allowance for legal. The green, those are animals that have no regulation under law or especially exempt. And then yellow, you see a lot of shading. Basically, a lot of illegality with wild animal keep. All right, so with that, let me just roll us to some discussion and then we've got some q and A. I'll try to keep this light. Most of all, contributions to knowledge as a scholar, this is interesting data. You really do not have species lists like this globally and especially not for the Caribbean. We can't compare it very easily to other countries, however, because this data is so rare. In fact, the last time any sort of household survey was done that's really comparable was by Carlos Druze in 2001 in Costa Rica, so over 20 years ago. And he did find uh, a higher percentage of households keeping animals, but not much more than what we found in Trinidad. We also have some data from the United States, thanks to the American Veterinary and Medical Association, which looked at non-poultry birds. So that was domesticated and wild birds. And just comparing TNT wild birds to the US, we know Trinidad and Tobago is a big wild animal keeping country compared to a temperate country like the US. We found substantial illegality, harms to animal welfare, and more limited harms to ecosystems through either extinctions or invasions. And we found a lot of reason to believe there's a need for management reform. Coming back to it, 97% estimated non-compliance with permits in Trinidad. And then you have so many animals that are prohibited and normally kept as pets. That's the green parrot. Then totally you found an estimated 93% of all wild animals have never been seen by a veterinarian. It begs the question, should you be requiring a veterinary to certify each animal when you permit? And then we have uncontrolled ecosystem risks. Endangered animals, animals posing an invasive species risk are treated no differently from other animals, at least in the law. It's up to the agency and the officer to decide with discretion. It requires a whole lot of education for each individual. We also have a lot of evidence that the system as it's designed is pretty much impossible to implement. Uh, as of today, in fact, there are, I believe, 45 game wardens in Trinidad and five in Tobago. We can estimate roughly how many game wardens you need to just permit on a one-year basis, all those animals requiring permits. If you assume one animal, again, our estimate is one animal per species per house. So you can assume one permit issuance requires at least an hour to inspect, to drive and do paperwork. So you could say 43,000 work hours, divide that by 260 working days a year, and you need at least 165 full-time staff just to do this system. And the forestry division is responsible for a whole lot more than just permitting wild animal keeping. We also know that if you were to even confiscate a small number, your rehabilitation centers would be hugely overwhelmed. We need more rehabilitation capacity as it is. So it begs the question that this system needs to be redesigned to be effective. We had some limitations that are again, just worth mentioning. The effectiveness of our methods, coming back to that household survey, ambiguous reports, underreporting in the survey. If you look at the two monkeys on your page, both are capuchins, but locally people keep the wedge capped capuchin on the right, but call it a white fronted capuchin on the left. It complicates things. So we did the best we could, but it's not perfect. As you've heard, permit records are very limited right now and can be improved for record keeping. And we hope to get better updated records as things are processed. And I know that the Trinidad Forest Division is working really hard to correct that. And uh, I really appreciate a lot of what I've seen and they've had a lot of new hires in recent years. They're doing great work with what they have. Also, the IUCN and GISD databases are limited. There are a lot of species that are in this trade that have not been assessed for the conservation potential. And we didn't get too much into it, but there are even introduced species that are not in the invasive species database, but might need to be assessed. And lastly, from a science perspective, conservative population estimates. 
this would be much more compelling if I had something a little bit more accurate accounting for how many animals are usually kept. In the realm of illegal fishing estimation, we find that you do use expert opinion-based estimation to fill in data gaps, but that's not really the trend in the limited literature for household surveying that we found, but could be something interesting to try in the future and get something a little bit more precise. So with that, I'm going to just say some quick acknowledgements, some big thank yous to the School of Criminal Justice at Michigan State University, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and USAID, the entire campaign coalition and advisors for the Nurture Nature campaign, the Forestry Division at the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, and so many research assistants who have helped out along the way. Uh, too many to mention real quick, but Lauren Ali and Nivan starred there who stayed on and became the campaign co-managers. They have been incredible every step of the way. And then many thanks also today for our uh, contributing photographers, Exotic Pets Plus Veterinary Clinic, Faraz Abdul, Nigel Walsing, Saifuddin Muhammad, and Zach Ali. Thank you so much for your incredible photos to help make this great presentation. Um, I will just flash one reference slide for academics out there. Oh, those are tiny. Uh, this is going to be recorded. If you see any references that you would like, please ask me. And with that, I will just hand this back to me for a minute and take a sip of water and you guys can jump into some Q&A with me. All right, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark. That was a great presentation. And we are opening the floor to Q&A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. If you want to be unmuted, just put your hand up, raise your hand, uh, use the Q&A tab. Uh, please feel free to ask away. We would love to jump in on some discussion. Amanda Gonzalez says, thank you, Mark. Fantastic job, Christiane. Well done, Mark. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Bob. Yeah. Please, anyone have any questions for Mark about the presentation? Um, I know it was maybe a little uh, pie chart heavy, <laughs> but <laughs> please, if anyone wants it to be explained further or have any other questions, please. Oh, Kristen asks, uh, if I have a neighbor with an illegal animal, can I report it? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, it is not, it, the response to this report will depend often on the animal, but one that is really high priority for the government are capuchin monkeys because they cause so many problems. It is never a good idea to have a pet capuchin. Might be a fun baby animal for a short amount of time. It will be a handful and impossible to keep long-term. They do not give permits out for capuchin monkeys. So if you see a capuchin, you can definitely report it and expect a response. You can contact in Trinidad, the uh, Trinidad Wildlife Section at the Forestry Division. And in Tobago, you can contact the Department of Natural Resource, Resources and Forestry, DNRF. And uh, the Nurture Nature campaign is also set up with Trinidad and Tobago Crime Stoppers. So if you don't feel comfortable making a report yourself and having your name attached to it, you can do it entirely anonymously and it will be reported to the appropriate authorities. Great, we have a few questions in Q&A. We have a Rod Supol. I wonder if you were related to the Supol that did the paper, are you? <laughs> uh, but he asks, would there be justification for wildlife health surveillance and veterinary wildlife forensics? So I say that again, it just, it just caught out the audio. Would there be justification for wildlife health surveillance and veterinary wildlife forensics? Yes. Yes. Um, oh, wow. Uh, that is something we hear uh, so commonly from the traffickers, the keepers of birds, especially. These animals come in sick. Uh, it is a huge risk. 
And uh, the, the wider animal trade has brought in quite a few new diseases. Um, I've heard over the years, uh, distemper has been brought in from Venezuela uh, at various times um, and other issues. So surveillance for pathogens, animal-based pathogens is, is absolutely needed. And it's just, uh, it's a wild, wild west on the, on the southern border with Venezuela. Notably, notably, uh, uh, pet shop operators and even pet owners themselves, uh, while these animals may be purchased or sold illegally and imported or smuggled illegally, they sometimes institute their own quarantine efforts. Uh, they don't want to keep the animals uh, with their other stock. So, you know, there's definitely a need for proper quarantine, proper uh health surveillance, veterinary wildlife forensics, for sure, along with obviously a well-regulated system of bringing these animals in if it is that the trade must persist. Um, somebody else asks, how can this information be made public on a wider scale, apart from the recording here? Well, the campaign hopes to continue on with its good work, spreading this message and delivering it to diverse audiences through our social media, our website, as well as, you know, now that COVID-19 has eased, we hope to be able to do some of the projects we wanted to in person. So we're hoping to be able to spread the message and have a true, truly uh, robust uh, attempt at getting this message out, all informed by this really important research. And for the academics, it, the, the research is going to be submitted for publication and, and peer review, and we expect it to be available through those media as well. Mm -hmm. Somebody else asks, how do you request a permit for either a protected or game species? I think, Lauren, if you're able to, can you drop the information uh, to the uh, wildlife section, the forestry division in the chat? That might be helpful. Um, uh, Romano McFallen has asked, what geographical locations was the sampling done in Trinidad and were there differences among these districts? Good question. Yeah, great question. Um, uh, I, will, I will try not to go too far into the weeds. It was uh, the statistical sampling that was done uh, through a tiered method. We had the um, administrative district uh, in Trinidad and Tobago as level one, and then the ED, enumeration district, as level two. And enumeration district is the smallest level of uh, categorization for census. And it has around 150 to 250 households. Um, and what we did is we randomly sampled a certain number proportional to each uh, administrative district's population. Uh, and then um, within each ED, enumeration district, we selected through random sampling um, that the central statistical office maintains maps with routes that you follow for collection. And then you can count certain number of houses from the start. And so you would just assign a number, you know, house number seven, house number 47, house number 107. Uh, probably wouldn't be patterned like that, but you get the idea. Uh, and this was done in every administrative division in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, in terms of diff differences amongst these districts, Mark, you can explain, but it is difficult to say, oh, well, this particular area has a higher um, prevalence of pet keeping than others based off of the uh, methodology. But there were definitely some spots that you can maybe say were hot spots. Yeah, it was it was population weighted. And so there's this is just um, there's different ways to do random sampling and there's there's no perfect way, unfortunately. But yeah, it, it gives a fairly robust sample for, for what we're looking at. So uh, within 95% confidence interval, we, we think we have a pretty good um, understanding of what, what is kept. Fantastic. Um, someone else in the chat is saying that they have a friend that's trying to get a monkey if there's any resources to help convince them not to. Well, we've got a whole webinar on why monkeys make bad pets. Um, you can direct them to that. We also have more easily digestible, simple Facebook posts and social media posts on why monkeys are terrible uh, pets. 
Um, we would love to one day uh, branch into video presentation. Everyone's telling us to get on TikTok, but we have yet to figure that out. Uh, maybe we need a, a Gen Z to help and, us out. <laughs> and we even we even have some friends of the campaign who previously kept monkeys and really regret it. Um, they can show you the bite marks. They can tell you all the tears about having it and then realizing coming to that day when you realize, I cannot keep this thing. And what do you do with it? it you can't put it back in the wild. Um, although many people try, but a lot of the animals end up dying. And then uh, some survive, as you see out in Northwest um, and in different parts of Trinidad now, but it's, it's really sad. Uh, and it's just, we, you just really need to stop the, the, the monkey keeping. Yeah, there's definitely, um, there's even research on the tufted capuchin in the Northwest Peninsula in Trinidad that has established an invasive population. But even recently, we're getting uh, more and more instances of uh, the wedge capped capuchin being released similarly there um, and having absolutely no ability to navigate the wilds, though they can, they can eventually, but these monkeys don't go through any proper rehabilitation process, which is necessary, but even then they're not native and so ideally would be repatriated to their native ranges, both the wedge capped and the tufted capuchin, um, which leads us into a question here in the chat from Jenny Constantine. If one person has a pet example of parrot for years and will like it, would like to hand it over for it to be cared for properly or reintroduced into the wild, is that possible? If yes, where can it be done? Um, yes, we actually just had a fantastic webinar hosted by Nikki uh, Buxton of Belize Bird Rescue, who has done fantastic work in Belize uh, with rehabilitating parrots um, there. And they've had success in rehabilitating parrots that have been in captivity for many years and were still able to be released. We in Trinidad and Tobago don't have as a wide a capacity for rehabilitation, but you can, um, you can relinquish pets. Uh, some vets will help facilitate this. If you don't know how to, they may pass the monkey or the bird or the parrot onto a rehabilitator or someone within the network to rehome. Um, our main rehabilitators, so in Trinidad, on our coalition is the El Socorro Center for Wildlife Conservation and Tobago, we've got uh, Corbin Local Wildlife Park. Both of these do take some uh, relinquishments. Uh, however, I believe Ricardo no longer takes uh, non-natives. Um, so only native animals because the capacity is a little I believe the zoo will also take um, relinquishments and that is often where confiscated animals will go as well. Now, I'll add, we, we would love to see more wildlife rehabilitation capacity. More can be done. Uh, I've heard recently even uh, some, some colleagues in Guyana, Guyana Wildlife Commission would be open to some repatriation of non-native monkeys. Um, if we had more investments in local wildlife rehabilitation, stuff like they do in Belize could be done here, where even an older parrot could be taught to return to the wild. And that's a, that's a big thing that keeps people from uh, giving up their animals is because they know that there's not currently very much capacity to rehabilitate, teach these birds to be wild birds again and let them go. But it's possible they they rehabilitate animals quite uh, up to like five or six or seven years old in, in Belize right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, our last uh, webinar with Ricardo on monkeys that he presented on, he definitely leaned into the desire to set up a repatriation project back um, that would be linked up with possibly Guyana where these monkeys have their native range. Um, so, you know, maybe one day we can get that, get the ball rolling on that. Um, we also have another question saying, considering the impossibility of forestry division being able to monitor and issue permits with their current setup and resources, what can be done to help the situation until either more staff can be hired or the system overhauled? Yeah, well, something it, it, that's rather interesting is the the one-year permit timeline is 
entirely imposed by the agency. The law actually gives tremendous leeway for how it's implemented. I think uh, a permitting period of up to three years per animal would be very appropriate. I think there are a lot of great veterinarians, especially, you don't have a huge amount of capacity for what they would call exotic pets, but training is available. You could see veterinarians take up some of the, uh, the capacity here, maybe writing certifications that these animals are well kept to reduce the inspection time. Um, and you could have forestry expand the time period that they issue. Uh, but you also could see things like digitization, um, moving things to online applications, uh, moving inspections to things like having a, a, a cell phone and an app involved, cutting out a lot of the paperwork. You could probably see the system fairly well imp implemented, but you'd have to make the changes. Great. Um, uh, Jenny Constantine also asked earlier in the chat, have there been any studies of the financial aspects of wildlife trafficking? Um, elsewhere, yes, and not, not so much here uh, or anywhere in the Caribbean. It, it is very limited. Uh, there's smattering of studies, though, that would like it from money laundering is common. You know, these are often illegal organizations or, or opportunistic criminals involved in trade. It, uh, there's a lot to be discovered. Um, if you're from Trinidad, you probably know that there are villages along the coast in the south, southwest, the Cacos village. I've read news articles interviewing people. Let me just straight up admit, you know, you, you got fish, coconuts, and Venezuela. <laughs> uh, the, the entire villages are dependent on the legal trade. And it's not just animals. That's something that we didn't get into today, which is really more about the organization of the trade. But these wild animals are coming over. They are mixing with drugs, guns, humans being trafficked over, but also other things you, you might not expect because of the humanitarian situation in Venezuela, uh, but agricultural animals, cows, goats, sheep, um, refrigerators, sacks of flour, rice. Um, so there's a, there's a huge illicit trade on the, on the Southern border and a lot of illegal activity. Um, there are pirates in the Caribbean and that's off the coast of Venezuela. Uh, someone says, has there been any considerations for wildlife, that is the second schedule animals, farming and permits to encourage this activity? Um, Mark, you wanna handle that one? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think our, our general position is we're not against it. Sometimes it can make sense but you, there needs to be some pretty careful criteria. Um, and I think one is it needs to be more efficient or just as efficient to breed them as to have them in the wild. Uh, our concern is that um, embracing farming, as we see elsewhere in the world, creates a lot of opportunity for laundering illegal animals, things you actually catch in the wild. So you need a strong regulatory structure uh, but it also can distract from the fact that if you don't act today to save what's in the wild, pretty soon all you'll have are these animals in farm situations, which is not good for forests. It's not good for ecotourism. It's not good for just your national heritage. These are Trinidadian forests that should be remain that should remain in, intact. So I think there there needs to be some uh, reasonable structure for some wildlife farming. But we have to be very careful for what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And that would be similarly for captive breeding of certain animals outside of just our second schedule as well. Yeah. So there's lots of suggestion of, you know, captive breeding for songbirds and the like, which there is some of that happens in South America yeah. as well as parrots. Um, and like a great example of, of songbird breeding in, in Brazil, uh, we have heard locally a lot of a lot of songbird enthusiasts. It's a big hobbyist community. There are, tr there's tremendous social ties. It is a very real, meaningful activity for people. And I, I see that. And there's a desire to breed, for instance, bullfinches 
to get away from this very legal destructive trade, but it's hard to do. Uh, I've heard allegations from different people that, ah, that person says they're breeding and it's, it's laundered. Okay, maybe, maybe not. But if we look beyond Trinidad to the best example of breeding songbirds, Brazil, um, they've done enforcement exercises where they briefly would tighten up control of captive bred rings. So knowing what birds wild versus captive bred. And when they do those enforcement exercises, you see behavior that basically suggests that around 90% of all captive bred birds are really just laundered in from the wild. So it just, it just says that you need tremendous regulatory power to be able to pull it off in a responsible way. Great, uh, do we have any other questions? Oh. Yeah, great, thanks for joining us, Ben. Sorry you have to jump off, but yeah, really pleased that you joined us and uh, Learned. <laughs> Nave, did we did we check Facebook? Oh, uh, I have not checked Facebook. Lauren, can you manage that one? Uh, yeah, I've been keeping an eye on Facebook, but it does not look like we have any questions that have been dropped there. Although Fazila Mohammed did tell us that we did an excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Fazila. Uh, Daryl, yes, you can get uh, this recording. We will. Well, it's. Uh, obviously recorded, but I will edit, I will snip out the bit at the beginning and I will put it onto our website. It will be available as a Facebook live recording on Facebook and then will be on YouTube and our website in about a day or two. So yes, you can definitely share this. You can watch it again. You can share it with your friends. You can share all of our other materials. You can, if you're not already, follow us on Instagram and Facebook and check out our website. And let me just give you that slide. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, there's all our contact info. And if you'd like to reach out to me, there's my email and Instagram handle as well. Great, well, any other questions before we wrap up? I know we're probably, we always go over time, but it's usually because we've always got a great Q&A section and everyone's so involved, so. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us this evening and for the fantastic questions. And thank you, Mark, for presenting. Really pleased to see the uh, presentation, uh, though I did spend lots of time <laughs> helping you make it. I also <laughs> helped collect the data, which is always great to see how it's been analyzed and what we found. Definitely, definitely. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I will, I will stop the screen share and the recording and I hope you all have a great night. Great, bye everybody.